Hello airplane designers! You found an open VSP tutorial from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. OpenVSP is an open source software application that you use to come up with a configuration for an airplane. And by configuration I mean the arrangement of just about all the aerodynamic services of the airplane. The wings, the tail, canard if you have canard, fuselage, nacelles, just about anything. And you can do it really rapidly with OpenVSP. OpenVSP isn't a 3D CAD program. It is a program that knows a lot about the parameters that you use in specifying an airplane. For example, for a wing, it knows what span is, cord, aspect ratio, dihedral, sweep, airfoil, it knows a lot about the parameters for wing and you just plug in the parameters and it makes the wing for you. It also knows similar things about parameterizing the fuselage, the pilot, nacelles, and other 3D bodies that you might have on an airplane. In this video series, we're going to go over some of the various aspects of OpenVSP that I'm fairly familiar with. Now, OpenVSP can do a whole lot more than I have used so far. So I'll make these videos as I learn more about OpenVSP. This first video is going to be an introduction where we talk about installing OpenVSP. It gets a little bit different than other programs you may have installed on your computer. The process is different. And then we're going to jump right into design a wing. Let's get to it. I imagine most of the viewers will be using a Windows 10 machine to do their development work for the airplane. So what I did was I went over to a Windows machine and I grabbed some snapshots on how to download and install OpenVSP on a Windows machine. What I did though is I took all those snapshots, put it into a slideshow and moved it over to my other machine which happens to be an Ubuntu uh, Linux OS based machine. And that's where I do all my work including making these videos. And I'm doing a voiceover on my Ubuntu machine just showing these slides. So here we go. I'll put a URL to the OpenVSP website down in the description for this video. In case you don't want to do a copy and paste or a click on that URL, you can actually just go into your browser and type in OpenVSP and hit the return. And of course what you'll show up with if you're on Google is something like this. OpenVSP is almost always the first thing you see. So you can go ahead and click on OpenVSP. This is the web page that generally shows up. You'll see this nice big fat download button and you can click on that to start downloading. Also on this main page, it's useful to scroll down and see what the recent posts are, the newest releases. I like reading those and see what's new and what's changed since the last release. But once you hit that download button, you come up to this page on the various operating systems that you can download on. Of course you got Windows, Mac OS, and Ubuntu. The top one for Windows is the 64-bit, and most of you will have a 64-bit machine, I imagine. A few of you may still have a really old 32-bit, and that's the second one. I do not have a Mac OS machine, so I have never done a download on that. So if you want to try that, you're on your own, but I imagine it'll be pretty easy and very similar to the Ubuntu process. On Ubuntu, as soon as we get done with the Windows install, I'll show you really quickly how to do Ubuntu. But on Windows, you click on this, it will download, and once you see that little circle that shows up there, once it's all filled in solid, you know it has been downloaded. What I do once it is downloaded, I do a hold down the left hand button and drag it over the desktop so it shows up on my desktop. Once it's on the desktop, right click on this zipped folder, and then left click on extract all, and it will extract the contents of the zip file. You can see it's a .zip extension. That means it's a zipped compressed file. It'll ask you where you want to send it to, and I just put it on the desktop. Just, And if you want to go to the desktop, that's fine. If you would like to put it in a different folder, browse around to the folder you want to put it into, and then you click on the extract. And generally, once it gets done extracting, it will pop up the folder that it extracted all the contents to this zip file into. Now you will probably have noticed this isn't the standard way that you do a Windows app install. Generally you'll click on an, an extractor and it'll either go and download or the program will be built into the extractor and it will go and put it over into an operating system programs folder. And then of course there'll be a little pop-up that asks you if you really want to do the install. 
and a little uh, white and yellow pop-up window in the center of your screen and it dims the rest of your screen. Of course, that doesn't happen here. It extracted all the uh, support files and the executable into this folder. So you're really kind of almost bypassing security, but you're not really. In order to run VSP, you double click on this VSP.exe program and that'll run it. The first time you run it though, Windows is, knows that you're trying to run an executable and it doesn't know anything about this. And so it'll say, hey, I'm trying to protect you from running something that could be dangerous. And of course, if you see this window and you never actually try to run something, don't run it because it may be dangerous and click the don't run. But if you do want to run it, click on this more info link and it'll show you there's no known publisher because the open VSP guys don't have a certificate to be a known publisher. But anyway, you click the run anyway and it'll run open VSP. This is what you see when open VSP starts. They use an architecture that lets them build across multiple platforms. You notice when we were looking at the download page before we can do Windows, Mac OS and Ubuntu. Because of the architecture they use, they can build on all three kinds of systems very easily. And so when you switch between systems, it'll look familiar on all three systems. Now this window over here on the left hand side is a terminal window. You won't ever do anything with that, but because of the architecture they use, this little terminal window has to pop up. Don't ever close it, just leave it alone. This is the main display window. And this is the window you do for operations. And we'll get to that in a moment. Let's go over and look on how to do the Ubuntu installation because that's where I'm going to do most of my work. Just like with the Windows machine, when you get to the Open VSP homepage uh, from Ubuntu, you still have this nice big fat download button. Go ahead and click on that. And you come to the download page. So on Ubuntu, you come down and click on this link. And similar to on Windows, you will see, at least with the Chrome browser, you will see the download, and this is a .deb file extension for Debian. Well, this will be down in our downloads directory. So come over here to our downloads. We can right click on that, and we can do open with software install click on the green install button. It wants to know our password to do the install. All right, we now have it installed. You now come down to this little matrix of dots down in the lower left-hand corner. You click on that to show all of our applications. We go down to open VSP. That's what it looks like on this installation. Click on that. And we have our two windows. Now we don't get a terminal window like we did on Windows. Ubuntu is kind of based on terminal windows and so you don't really need one. I told you I was going to show you how to make a simple wing, so let's get started on that. And keep in mind for this tutorial, we're using OpenVSP, which is version 3.19.0. I just turned on a feature of my screen recording software that will show key clicks and button presses and maybe that will help a little bit to give you an idea of what I'm doing with the mouse and the keyboard as we go along. I said I was going to show you how to make a wing so let's get started on that. Come up to your geometry browser on this multi item selector where it says pod currently. We'll click on that and we will come down to wing click on that and then you have to hit the add button and we have a wing. I'm sure you noticed that it brought up a window over here and that dialog is to set parameters for the wing. Before we get to that though, let me show you a little bit about how to manipulate the display over here. Now you'll notice when I click down that a little blue dot shows up. That indicates I've clicked on something. So that kind of helps you know what I'm doing. Now unfortunately the screen recording software I'm using doesn't know how to show you when I hit the control, alt, or shift key. So I'll just have to tell you when I'm doing that when I do a click. As I click the left button and hold it down and then move the mouse, you'll be able to see that I can rotate the wing about an axis. Now here I'm moving it horizontally and it rotates about a vertical axis. Let me straighten it up a little bit. And I can do the same thing about a horizontal axis. Now it isn't exact, 
if you have your mouse moved off to the side a little bit, it'll start getting cattywampus. And then if you move your mouse out to an edge, you can rotate it about the axis coming in and out of the screen. So that's pretty easy to rotate around. And they made it easy because this is what you'll probably be doing most often as you're working on objects on your airplane is just rotating it around. So that's pretty easy. And it's fairly intuitive after you've done it a little bit. Now, sometimes your object will get larger than the screen and you want to zoom back out. Hold the control button down and then click and hold. Move your mouse up and down and it'll change the size. Now, sometimes you need to pan over left, right, or up or down. So hold down the Alt key and then click and hold. And you can move anywhere you want to. The object will follow your cursor around on the screen. Let me give you a few other tidbits on using the screen and the view. Let's uh, get this guy in an odd shape here like that. Come up to the view menu and let's say you want to see the top of the wing. Just click top. You also have front, left, bottom, rear, and right. You also have these left ISO and right ISO. That gives you a kind of a 3D view from an angle. So you got left ISO and right ISO. And then if you happen to have your airplane off way off to the side for whatever reason, you can always bring it back to the center by clicking center. Let's get back to a top view here. If your wing or airplane get a little bit too big, let's say you zoomed in to look at something and now you don't want to have to go through hitting the control button and scrolling back and back to try to get it to fit the screen again. You can uh, hit fit on screen menu item and you got it back on the screen. Let's get down to the good stuff. Let's make a wing. And I think what we'll probably make is a Piper Tripacer wing. I spent a lot of hours as a kid in a Piper Tripacer, so it'll be fun. I looked up the specs for the Piper Tripacer. The wingspan is 29 and a quarter feet, and the wing area is 147 and one half feet. The Piper Tripacer has a 1 to 1 chord ratio. In other words, the root and tip chords are both the same. It has a little bit of dihedral. It does not have any sweep. It's a straight wing. The wing tips are semicircles. Now, the semicircles might be a little bit difficult to do on the wing tip, and I will show you why. Let's get started on that wing. By the way, if you ever happen to accidentally delete your geometry browser, you can always come up to the model drop down menu and pick geometry and that will pop up your geometry browser. To add a wing, we come up to this drop down list, click on that, come down to the wing item, click that. That only selects what you want to add. You then have to hit the add button next to that drop down list. And we have a wing. By default, we always have a swept and tapered wing. And another thing to mention about these wings is that in OpenVSP, you're only really dealing with one side of the wing. The other side is just a mirror. And let me show you that real quick. If we come over here to the X form, and we come down to the symmetry and the planar row, you'll see this XZ is selected. If we unselect that, it gets rid of it. So in order to have symmetry across the XZ plane, which will be a plane coming out of the screen, in the left right direction. In the future, I will come back and we will work a lot more with symmetry. We will do a little scale factoring and we'll talk about how to attach something to a parent and the transforms. We'll talk about those, how to change location and how to do rotations. But we'll save that for a future video. Right now, we're just trying to figure out the rudimentary operations to get a wing made. And also in the future, we'll come back to the gen window, talk about how to change color, how to change texture the tessellation, the mass properties, and how to do these sets. We will probably save the sub tab for quite a bit later. That's for adding things like lines and ailerons and rudders and such. But what we do want to do for this wing is use this plan area. Now plan is specific to a wing. If you add a fuselage or nacelle, you will generally have these same three beginning tabs but the rest of them will be different for different objects. 
you can do gross changes to the wing. In other words, very high level changes to the wing. For example, you can set the span. Let me make this a little bit wider so we can see the numbers a little better. You can set the span. You can set chord. You can set area. And it'll show you aspect ratio. Tip treatments we will come back to when we start to try to make that semicircle tip. Root instance we will come to at a future video and tessellation control will come to in a future video. But for now, let's go ahead and set this wingspan. I said it was uh, 29 foot 3 inches, which is 29 and a quarter feet. Now you'll find that sometimes setting these values is kind of in vain. When we go and change some of these section values, it'll end up changing some of these values automatically. And let's go ahead and set the area, which was uh, 147 and a half feet. Now you can see it ended up changing the span on us. So sometimes you're kind of fighting these things. I've found that uh, typically I don't bother with this. I just deal with all these values in section. And by the way, a wing can have multiple sections, which is why it's a little easier to deal with in sections. If you change it up here on the total plan form, and let's say you change the span, it doesn't know how much span should go in one section and another section. So it's really overall better to do all of your changes in the sections. But I just wanted to show you this, that overall, very quickly, you can do some changes. Well, let's go over and start playing with that section area. Up in this wing section area is where you change which section is the active section. Now by fiddling with this, I can see that I only have one section right now. And that's good because we only need one section. We will ignore the interpolated cross sections for the moment. That's basically a deal with tessellation again. The section we really want to deal with is the section plan form. We will deal with sweep and we will deal with dihedral. At some future time we'll deal with twist. And that's basically because we don't need it in order to make a Hershey bar wing. A straight wing with a one to one taper ratio, you don't typically need to add twist. Twist is usually used to twist the tip of the wing down a little bit so it has a lower angle of attack at the root and that helps force the root to stall before the tip does. But that's not the only thing that will cause the root stall before the tip does. You can do a forward sweep to do that and you can also use the lift distribution to do that. And with a Hershey bar wing, we just happen to have a lift distribution that will cause the root of the wing to stall before the tip, even if you don't add any twist to the wing. Let's get rid of the sweep. We don't need that, and that's easy to do. I will come over and just get rid of that three, hit a return, and that gets rid of the sweep. Now you'll notice that it changed the sweep at the leading edge to zero. Where that sweep is specified is by the second line, the sweep location. And right now it's at zero, meaning the leading edge. Now I can use this slider to move all the way over to the right. If you try to go to one, it won't work. And that's because it interferes with secondary sweep location, which we will not talk about in this video. But you can see now this trailing edge is very, very close to zero sweep. Now once we change our taper ratio to one to one, it won't matter where we put this sweep location and let's just go ahead and do that. Let me click on taper ratio. Let's set it to one. And now it doesn't matter where we put that sweep location. Doesn't change the sweep over overall wing at all. And that's because like I said, our taper ratio is set to one. And that's really all we need to do to talk about sweep. Let's go back up to our section plan form. Well, we just showed you taper ratio. You'll notice these little radio buttons on the left. You can have one radio button set in each column. And what that really means then is we only need three different parameters to define a wing section. That defines the span, the root cord, and the tip cord. But you can get those values in more than one way. If we have taper, and tip cord, we can calculate root cord, or vice versa. If we have taper and root cord, we can have tip cord. If we have taper and average cord, we can get root cord and tip cord. If we have aspect ratio and one of these cords and taper, then we can calculate the span. And that's what this section platform is doing. So based on which parameters you already know for your section, 
You can pick the ones that are appropriate and it'll calculate the rest for you. The three things we know about our wing are that we know the span, we know the area, and we know the taper. And then everything else be can be calculated. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about a section of the wing. So we're talking about a span of just the section. The span we had for the total wing was 29 and a quarter feet. And if we divide that by two, it is 14 and 5 eighths. So let's go ahead and put that into span. 14.625. Oops, forgot the decimal. We know the area, which was, again, just for the section. So half of 147.5 is 73.75. And our taper ratio is one. That should be our wing. Now let's zoom back out a smidgen. Except for the tips, that's very close to being the wing for our airplane. While we're here, let's go ahead and throw in dihedral. Now I do not know what the dihedral is for the Piper Tripacer, so let's just pick something that looks reasonable. Let's do our front view. And the dihedral is probably around two to three degrees, so I'm just gonna use this slider to go up that way. You know, that looks about right there at two. I'd say that's pretty close. Let's take a look at what the airfoil looks like. Why don't we uh, hold down the mouse button on the index side and we will swivel around and then hold down the Alt key to center it and then hold down the Control key and scroll down. As you can see, we have a symmetrical airfoil. And of course, the Tripacer did not have a symmetrical airfoil. It had some lift to it. If I remember right, the Tripacer had a airfoil called the USA-35B. I think I'll save until another video importing a .dat file that has airfoil coordinates in it. And we'll use something like the XFLR5 program to generate an airfoil. Instead, let's use some of the built-in airfoil generation mechanisms. Another thing to point out here, let me go over to the airfoil tab. You can see that it has a zero here. It turns out that sections are large areas and we only have one. Airfoils though are done at specific spots instead of a large area. And let me uh, move this down just a little bit. You see this root airfoil has a nice big wide blue area. That's the one that's currently highlighted and that's what this zero represents. If I arrow over, it increases to one and now you can see that this one over here is highlighted. Now that's because this green box is the section we're actually working on. But as we change this airfoil over here, since it's symmetric around the XZ plane, this one will change also. So instead of having to deal with all these extra lines looking through at the end, we'll just come down here at this end. Let me get that centered again and zoom back in. Now if you look here underneath type, you can see that it says four series. That means it's a NACA four series airfoil. In other words, four digits are used to specify the airfoil shape. I'm not gonna get into much what the individual digits are. Let's just come down and use these numbers. T over C is the thickness. It's a ratio of thickness of the airfoil to the cord. And right now it's at 0 0.10. That means the thickness is 10% of the cord. I imagine that on the tri-pacer, the thickness was more than that. It's probably up closer to 15. So why don't we just crank that up a little bit using this scroll bar. That's close enough. And it's fat enough that I think that looks about right. Also, we need some camber. Right now we have a symmetric airfoil. It has the same shape of the airfoil on the top and the bottom. We really need flatter on the bottom and a little more curvature on the top. So camber is very similar. This camber represents a number which is similar to the thickness over cord ratio. Something called a mean camber line is the halfway line between the bottom and the top of the airfoil. If we put a camber on here where we have more curvature on the top and less on the bottom, that mean camber line will then curve up from the leading edge, a little higher in the middle, and then come back down again. 
wherever that maximum distance is from the cord to that mean camber line, where that max is, that's gonna be some percentage of the cord. That's what this camber is representing. And we're probably gonna be at somewhere around 0 0.03, 0 0.04 for the camber. So let's go ahead and do that. So you can see it increasing there. Let's go up to uh, 0 0.03 and see what that looks like. Now we have a little bit of an issue. We can specify where that maximum occurs. Right now it's at 20% of the cord. And that's awfully far forward. It's not usually like that. It's usually gonna be somewhere back around 30% probably. So let's, uh, let's try 25, that didn't quite look right. Let's go back a little more. 28 that's starting to look about right but I don't think we're flat enough on the bottom so let's crank up that camber just a little bit more let's not bother going above four because that won't be right the four looks about right we're nearly flat on the bottom we have some nice camber so I'd say that's about right for our airplane and if we come up here it's called a 4315 and that sounds about right we have this four is 4% 4 of the camber. The three is means it's 30% back on the cord. And of course the 15 is the thickness. Frequently the calculation for doing the NACA four digit airfoils leave a little bit of a blunt edge on the back. But this chuck mark means to sharpen that edge. Now typically that edge is not truly sharp in real life. It's probably rounded off just a little bit. So in real life, you'd probably not sharpen it. You'd unclick that. Well, all this changing we've been doing is only out here at the tips. Let's go ahead and scroll to the other tip and you'll be able to see that it has changed also. We'll ignore the root for the moment so you can see it has a similar camber, but the root cord, it's still that old symmetric one. Well, we'd like to use the same one. The tri-pacer had the same cord throughout the wing. So what you can do is come back up here, do a copy Come back down to the zero cord. You can see it's highlighted now. Hit paste. Now it has the same camber. The only thing left to do now is to make the tips of the wing. Let's go up to view. Let's hit a top view. Let's scroll out just a little bit. All right, here's the front of the wing. Here are the tips. What we would like to have is a semicircle, a pretty darn close to semicircle out here. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a good or easy way to do that. Let me show you the tip setup that we have. We come back to the plan tab and you can see this tip treatment section. Now we leave the root alone. We don't want to muck with that at all, but out here at the tip cap, we want to do some changes. It's currently set to flat. We have several options. Now round, unfortunately, doesn't mean what you would like for it to mean. Let's go ahead and click on that. So you can see it added just a little bit. Let's scroll down and zoom in on that so we can get a little better view of it. So you can see it added a little bit to it. It kind of gave you a roundness here at the beginning, but it's sharp back here at the trailing edge. Well, let's play with some of our numbers here. We have a length, let's, uh, it's set to one. Let's start working on that. Let's increase it with the scroll bar. And we're up to two now, so you can see we pretty much doubled that distance. Now we can click on this little right arrow here to give us a little more range. We went up to three, four, we're starting to get close. So with five, if this was a semicircle, that'd be pretty close to correct to give us a nice semicircle. And as you can see, it comes out at 90 degrees here at the leading edge. It swirls around and it goes back to a point. So we can't really get a semicircle with this. The offset has to do with how far up or down, in this case, it'd be in or out of the screen this tip is. Basically something like adding camber. Well, you know what, let's go, I'll just go ahead and show that to you. Let's do a uh, front view. Let's pan over to that tip. So you can see the tip here. Let's play with that offset so you can see what it does. I'll uh, come in just a little more. There we go. Now I'll just move this offset to the right so you can see it cambering up. 
and cambering down. Now this doesn't look very round. It's called the round tip, but that's just because we don't have enough tessellation here. Up here under tip treatment, you see this cap tessellation? You can actually crank that up and then you can start seeing it get round. So there, there you can see it. And I think to help us out, we'll just leave that up for now. And to help out a little bit, let's go back to the top view. We'll pan up here to the end and then come back out just a little bit. And just for grins, let's go ahead and play with a couple of these others. Now these others are going to give a very similar shape, at least as far as the top view. That's the edge, and here's sharp. The only thing that will change is how it looks from the front view. So let me go ahead and give you a quick view of that. Let's go to the front view again. Pan over. So you can see here what happens with sharp. It gives you a very sharp leading edge. And in fact, if you wanted something called a horner tip, you would use sharp and then would use offset to raise this tip up so that the top edge had the same dihedral as the wing. So we could use offset to do that. So that would basically give you a horner tip. And let's go back to edge. With edge, you can actually make a sharp tip. If you'll notice, sharp actually gives you a strength. We can actually crank that up and you'll see what strength does. So look at the bottom edge here. You can see that it, it what it does is it makes this down here have a shape closer to the bottom angle and then curves it around. And let's go ahead and go back to the top view. That's about all we can do with the tips. There is a way to cheat and make it look round. In a future video, when we start using this blending tab, I'll show you how to do that. But basically what you do is you add another section. Instead of using tip, you add another section of the wing, but about the same size as this tip is occupying. You put a tiny little airfoil out here on the very tip that's only a couple inches long. And then you do kind of what this front edge of this tip is doing where you bring this edge out at 90 and then you curve it around to a, a different 90 here at that little airfoil. And then you do the same thing on the edge. You bring this edge out at 90 and then curve it around to the airfoil again. So you can kind of cheat and make a semi-circle wing tip. But like I said, we've got a lot more to talk about, a lot more capabilities to get to just for these wings. And that'd be the blending and modify tabs. We'll get into what those are. We will get into more of what tessellation control is and why you might want to play with that. We'll play a little bit more with twist. On airfoil, we'll learn a bit, little bit of, more about the various kinds of airfoils we can create and how to import an airfoil from a .dat file. We'll get into blending, which has to do with how to deal with leading edge and trailing edge angles and dihedrals. We will do a little more interesting stuff with dihedral also. We can make winglets out on the wingtip. And I'll show you how I made the rudder section on the tail of the UWS-1 ultralight using dihedrals and using blending. Well, I didn't want to get too involved in this first video, this simple introduction. I wanted you to have at least a bare minimum information on how to start playing with this program and create a wing that you might want to have. As you can tell, we have a lot more tutorials coming in the future. We will do some tutorials on the XFLR5 program on how to make airfoils and how to analyze them. And at some point, we'll probably have some tutorials on CAD programs when I start exporting airplanes from OpenVSP and importing them into CAD so I can start manufacturing parts like plugs. So stay tuned.